So I was recently watching a Q2 estimate video by James Stevenson, and what a great idea we saw. He was mentioning how wiggly the Tesla Q math can get, and I asked him to join us for an interview to discuss it. I'm Brian, welcome to my Tesla weekend. James, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Brian. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's a so pleasure exciting. to be on the show. And yeah. you can always follow him on Twitter at I cannot underscore enough. He's got a great thing going on there. Does really good, uh, really good numbers, really good, uh, really good estimates, and uh, it's just kind of fun. It's just kind of fun. Well, you, you're so, being modest. I've seen your uh, projections, and they're pretty good too. <laughs> yeah, I think you and yeah. Troy Tesla like both got about as close on the Q2 deliveries numbers. Uh, yeah, we're both around point three off. Yeah, uh, well, not he many was, people can claim that accuracy. Yeah. Well, Troy focuses on deliveries, and I focus on production. Yeah. So. Um, I was closer on production, and uh, but he was also in the same margin of error for for his deliveries. He yeah, does great you just work. Just about nailed it. You both had two hundred and fifty eight thousand, or or the the actuals came in right at right around where you were. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty I great. I put a substantial amount of work into it. <laughs> so thank you, yeah. thank you. Yeah. So the first one, the thing you brought up was the Tesla Q loves to back the regulatory credits out of the numbers, even though that's not a thing. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, that's not a thing. Uh, it, it's one of the favorite metrics that Tesla Q has been using for a long time. And uh, maybe what I'll do is just bring up uh, my forecast. And I've got my display so big. Oh, can we share screens in? Uh, I think you can, yes. Mm -hmm. In Riverside? Awesome. All right. And bam, you're on James's desktop. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, this is the forecast that uh, Brian was just mentioning, my most recent uh, Tesla forecast. And I put a lot of charts into this. So here's one of them. But the one that uh, you just mentioned is a little further down as I scroll through. And yeah, so this is one of the ways that you can look at earnings and i think it's the right way to look at it it's just non-gap earnings per delivery this is the metric that wall street cares about when they talk about adjusted earnings this is the number they're going to use less any one-time or non-sustainable items that happen and the way i've graphed the data here for you is on a trailing 12-month basis to smooth out seasonality and I threw in a box over here just to let you know where I have thrown $2 billion worth of deferred tax benefits that I think Tesla is going to declare, but they'll get backed out of adjusted non-GAAP earnings. So this is just the, the total non-GAAP earnings number. And this is the right way to look at this. So I'll go a couple of tweets down to get to the, the payoff on this, which is the same chart that you just looked at, except excluding regulatory credits. Uh, which isn't much different anymore, uh, but you can see why in 2019 the short sellers wanted to show off this metric. Oh, and I'm also uh, doing this on a per delivery basis so that you can see how much money is Tesla earning per delivery. Uh, yeah, back then it was losses. If you take the bottom line earnings number and then subtract from that top line revenue of the kind of product that you sell that's the most profitable for you. Uh, and that, that's not a thing. And if you Google it, you'll find that the only instances of uh, earnings excluding regulatory credits come from Tesla Q, uh, Tesla haters, uh, mentioning that number. Uh, so that they can throw it out and make Tesla's profit look bad. But if you were to try that same thing with, I don't know, uh, McDonald's and say, hey, uh, is McDonald's really earning any money? Do they really have any profits? Well, let's throw out their most profitable kind of uh, sales and then see. So let's throw out the sales of non-alcoholic beverages at McDonald's, right? If they didn't sell any soda or coffee, then what would would be left? Well, let's throw out their revenue that they make from selling soft drinks and coffee from the bottom line number and see what's left. I guarantee it's a negative number if you do that, right? 
because it's an invalid uh, exercise. You can't do that in accounting, and no other uh, company has to put up with uh, haters on Twitter trying to adjust for that and make charts about it. Well, and that's the crazy thing is they'll do that on the one side, <clears throat> but they don't go and add that, uh, take that revenue off the competitors. So if Fiat Chrysler yeah. spends a billion dollars on regulatory credits, why aren't we seeing what they should have paid? And why aren't we looking at Fiat Chrysler and saying, you know, Stellantis and saying, well, their profit is actually this much when you add on what they should yeah. have paid in fines once Tesla's no longer willing to sell them credits. Yeah, that's true too. Yeah, so if you're if you're gonna subtract the regulatory credits revenue from Tesla's earnings, you should really go put them back on the income statements of the companies who bought the regulatory credits from Tesla, because uh, so some people get the the, the wrong-headed notion that regulatory credits are um, a, a stipend from the government, that governments are giving you taxpayer money. And that is not what's going on at all. The money you're making is from selling to your competitors who did not produce enough electric vehicles to comply with applicable law. That's what that money is, right? It's, hey, uh, competitors who did not make enough electric vehicles and don't want to have to pay fines to the government for non-compliance, we will sell you some of our extra electric vehicle credits that we don't need because everything we produce is electric. So Tesla would never be subject to a fine no matter how many regulatory credits they sell. Uh, yeah, very, very, very funny to think about Fiat Chrysler um, putting, putting money back into their earnings by giving them back the money they spent on regulatory credits. That's, that's a funny concept. Or just not counting the savings that they got from paying less for the credits than they would have for the fines. Because it's all a business decision. Yeah. And right, and then why would you prevent, discount? Uh... Oh, I was going to say, why would you discount? Well, you know, but well, discount a thing that was part of your business integral from the beginning. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's a level playing field. Anybody could have been making all these electric vehicles and having surplus regulatory credits that they could have been selling. Tesla was just the company that figured out how to make money on every vehicle they produce twice, once by selling it to the buyer who owns it, and again to a competitor who did not make enough electric vehicles to comply with applicable law. That's uh, something Tesla should be rewarded for, having business savvy and um, uh, production efficiency to be able to make a profit off doing that. Uh, any of their competitors could have done that and didn't. Uh, and, and the thing that I wanted to mention very quickly was just so nobody puts it in the comments that I forgot an important thing. When you throw out just the regulatory credits revenue, you're not tax affecting the uh, earnings. So because Tesla made profits selling regulatory credits, they had to pay more in taxes. So you can't just come down to the bottom line after tax and then take out the revenue because that revenue caused uh, Tesla to have to pay more in taxes, you would have to put back uh, the tax money as well that were that was driven by the regulatory credits. And to a lesser extent, the actual costs associated with dealing with the paperwork and the contracts and the filings and all that. Yeah, hopefully that's not a, a huge significant cost uh, to Tesla of having to sell the regulatory credits. There, there definitely are some costs of that, but to take it back to the McDonald's analogy, McDonald's has to pay for bag in a box from Coca-Cola to be able to sell fountain drinks. They have to buy orange juice. They have to buy coffee, right? So all of those costs of sales um, would also be gone if you're going to throw the revenue out, but no adjustment was being made for that here, uh, which is why it's a totally invalid accounting metric. You can't just throw out uh, the regulatory credits and, and call that good. Well, in looking back at the at the competition again, we know from last year that the Bolt was being sold at a loss. We know from this year that the costs of goods has gone up, and we know that the price of the Bolt has been reduced. You know, because demand is so strong. But they're doing it because it makes sense yeah. when you factor in that they're not having to buy as many regulatory credits. They're counting the same money, and we're not discounting it from them. 
Yeah, Mary led. Uh, if you if you listen to Joe <laughs> Biden, uh, he'll tell you that uh, you did it, Mary. Uh, and it yeah, matters in Q4. The, 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 and, it, and it matters. You led, and it matters. Uh, in in Q4 of 2021, General Motors sold 26 electric vehicles. They sold 25 bolts, and they sold one electric Hummer. I believe two Mary Barra. I think she was the buyer of the one electric Hummer. And uh, yeah, Tesla sold over 300,000 electric vehicles. But Mary led, right? She she led the the halting of production of Bolt that caused that to occur. Well, the Bolt is straight fire. We know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, straight straight. It's so much so that uh, many public uh, parking lots will not allow you in. Well, <laughs> they won't let yeah, they they say the bolt. bolt is the Note Seven of the automotive world. <laughs> I haven't been following the Note 7, but I take it they take, they catch fire. Yeah, that was the one that they banned from planes. <laughs> oh, all right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, and that's, a, that's a good analogy. So another wiggly bit of math I saw was uh, when they were not when they were backing out the ZEV credits, they would also, uh, they would say, well, once you take those out, the company wouldn't be profitable. And, I, and to which I'd said, well, actually, if you took those out, Elon wouldn't have hit milestones. You have to add the stock compensation back in. Oh, sure. And yeah. again, yeah. like you were saying, they're they're pulling the revenue off one side without accounting for it on the other side. Yeah. Uh, and when you see somebody uh, up to shenanigans like that, you have to ask, you have to question their motivations for it, right? Uh, and just to give you a visual besides uh, our two ugly mugs. <laughs> <laughs> you say okay, ugly, yeah. but you do not understand how much work actually goes into this. <laughs> Funny. Uh, so here, here is a graphic visualization of the expense that Tesla has recorded each quarter since uh, the 2018 CEO Performance Award was enacted uh, to compensate Elon. So he doesn't have a salary, and he doesn't have any kind of guaranteed cash bonus. And most CEOs do have either or both of those as part of their compensation package. What Elon said was, hey, if I can't grow the revenue and the EBITDA and the market capitalization of this company, the value of people's investments in this company, by tremendous amounts, you don't owe me anything. I'll make zero dollars if I can't do those things. So uh, the way the gap accounting treatment works is as Elon made progress towards achieving those aggressive goals that I just outlined, Tesla had to record expense relative to the proportion of the 12 tranches that uh, Elon was making progress towards achieving. Um, and this is not widely understood. So another thing that we saw in Q1 of uh, 2022, the most recently reported quarter, was Tesla Q crying foul over the reduction in SG&A year over year. So they said, hey, last year it was, you know, a billion dollars or whatever. This year it's only 800 million or whatever, right? Uh, I'm going from memory and getting the numbers wrong for sure but something close to those. Uh, what gives? It must be fraud, right? It has to be fraud. There's no way your SG&A could have come down by that much year over year. Well, it's because <laughs> a year ago, Elon was still making tons of progress towards achieving these market cap and revenue and EBITDA milestones. And this year, the work's done already, right? It was all almost completely uh, achieved by the end of 2021, so there's almost nothing left to pay against it. Um, there was a Black-Scholes model run to determine the value of the entire package at the plan outset, and it was $2.283 billion. So that is the maximum amount of expense that Tesla can declare against this compensation package over the 10-year life of the plan. And my expectation is by the end of this year, it'll be out. They'll have expensed all of it. <sighs> yeah, um, when the when the new compensation plan was announced, I showed my wife an article that said, 
if it hits all the milestones, he will have the biggest payday in in executive history. And my wife said, wow, is that too much? I said, you realize that our very small investment would be able to pay off the house. So right. if I get to pay off my house for yeah. a, a few dollars, um, I'm okay with it. Yeah. And it's not real cash. It just has to be accounted as cash. So why does... Yeah, so this is a non-cash expense, right. uh, the stock-based compensation. <clears throat> and w it, it's basically back here in 2018, Tesla wrote Elon 12 IOUs that were each conditional. And what he said was, hey, I would like to buy a ton of shares at today's prices, but I don't have the cash. So can you please write me 12 IOUs and I'll buy shares at today's price if in the future I can achieve all these goals. So that's what that stock-based compensation is. Uh, his uh, percentage share of the company has become so valuable now that he can borrow against it to buy all those shares, which he was unable to do at the time. So he couldn't have bought another 12% of the company back then. Does, uh, but now he can. And does his, uh, do those purchases show up as revenue for Tesla because he has to buy them? No, they, they show up as paid in capital on the balance sheet. So they're selling him additional shares of Tesla. So this is- But he's paying cash um, for them. Diluting. It's diluting existing shareholders and he's paying cash for it. So the cash does go onto the balance sheet, but the offsetting entry for that is paid in capital on the equity line. So it's not revenue because Tesla is not in the business of selling shares. Right. It doesn't pass the normal course of business test um, in accounting. See, they, they tell you that you'll never use this stuff again. And then you, you do a YouTube interview with somebody and it comes in handy to know, know your accounting basics. Oh yeah, I was assured by classmates I'd never use high school algebra, but that's what my Excel spreadsheets are entirely. <laughs> yeah, So, yeah, Excel is, is great. Why does Tesla's yeah. quarterly reports always include a line item for less regulatory credits if it's not a thing? It's a thing. Yeah, it's real money. So yeah, and that does count as revenue. So Tesla is in the business of selling cars and selling regulatory credits is selling cars. Uh, and the reason we know that is that if you don't make cars, you can't sell regulatory credits. Mary learned that one. Um, <laughs> yeah, Mary learned that one in Q4 when she stopped making bolts and could only sell 25 of them from... from Another stock. bit of yeah. big fraud that I saw from the Fudsters was Reducing warranty reserves is is accounting malpractice. Oh, sure, yeah. Was that uh, at uh, or there a boot? Uh, Luis Carruthers might have been the, the account behind that one. One of them had a guarantee on their uh, Twitter account uh, that if you could find any flaw in their bare thesis about warranty reserves, that uh, they would give you money for it. And I think, uh, yeah. Let's see, warranty reserve FUD. I've been fighting this FUD for a long time. Look at this, 2019. Uh, yeah, that warranty reserve berry tail is some persistent FUD. I think Tesla haters like it so much because who really understands what a warranty reserve is? Or how, how it works or how you know whether you've accrued enough. Uh, they have it backwards like always. Check the date below, October 30th of 2019. So way back then, I found a publication for warranty professionals that had dug into exactly this question, uh, which you can uh, summarize really quickly. Hat tip to uh, V. Grinchpen for uh, tweeting it originally. But uh, yeah, if you just compare uh, Tesla against Ford and GM, um, uh, warranty claims by Tesla owners are lower than GM, Ford, or Fiat Chrysler as a percent of revenue. So that's one of the things. Another one is Tesla is accruing more warranty reserves as a percentage of sales than the other U.S. automakers are. And there's a chart here that shows that. Um, so uh, at the time that you sell someone a car, you have to assume that there will be some warranty uh, covered expenses. They're going to bring some of the cars back to you for some things that go wrong with them. 
and you're going to have to repair those at your own expense under warranty. So at the time of the sale, you have to go ahead and accrue uh, warranty reserves as a balance sheet item as a liability, right? So that's what's going on here. And the last chart is another way of looking at it is warranty reserves per vehicle sold. Here again, Tesla is much more conservative, uh, but some of the difference in this metric goes to Tesla selling more expensive vehicles on average than Ford and GM make. Uh, but it's not close. I mean, look at these pink uh, rectangles. Tesla is accruing way more warranty reserve per vehicle than other companies are. And they've actually scaled it back some and the justification that Zach gave for them in the 10K was that it's based on trending. So if you look at the actual um, warranty expenses that have been coming into Tesla to repair, it's been less than they were expecting uh, because less is going wrong or because it's costing less than Tesla had assumed when they uh, made the, uh, the warranty reserve. But I mean, this is thick accounting stuff that it is easy to confuse people on when they don't have any background in uh, financial analysis or accounting. Uh, luckily, I've got a business degree and an MBA and some uh, relevant experience in my professional life that uh, I can bring to bear against these questions. <laughs> Maybe I saw this bear on the screen and that prompted me to say bring to bear. Uh, but I, I hope that addressed your question about warranty. Well, then the claim that they make to follow it up is, right, but they just mark everything as a goodwill rather than a warranty. All right. Well, let's go with that. Okay. L let's grant that that uh, is true and that Tesla is calling stuff goodwill instead of warranty expense. It's still <laughs> expense. It's expense either way. You can call it warranty expense or you can call it goodwill expense. Either way, it counts against your profits. The earnings number doesn't change. It's just two different ways of classifying the expense, right? So e either it hits your P&L directly or uh, it results in uh, decrementing the warranty reserve liability. But either way, it comes through the income statement as expense. You know, and it makes sense that Tesla would have to put aside more per car because when it comes to big companies like GM, it's not like you're going to have 100% of batteries recalled. <laughs> uh, well, for the bolts, uh, GM did have to recall. Oh, yeah, that's right. Now I remember. That turned out to be billions yeah. of dollars. <laughs> All right. I'm, I'm glad I didn't just agree. <laughs> well, the point is. Assumption. I brought my critical thinking skills with me to we this have, discussion. What bothers me is the inconsistency. If you're going to be critical on one mm -hmm. side but not critical on the other, it doesn't make sense. So my biggest pet peeve that I see all the time on social media is Elon is nothing but a pump and dump. <laughs> Never mind the fact that he doesn't actually yeah. sell anything. He doesn't dump. He doesn't, you know. Yeah. Yeah, he, he owns more shares now than he did a year ago or two years ago, and he's probably going to buy more shares if he can extricate himself from the Twitter uh, situation. So he still owns more Twitter stock than anybody else does right now, far more than the people on Twitter's board combined. Well, 9% <laughs> was the last Which, figure uh, I saw. He, yeah, 9.2% for Elon, and then the board And Jack combined. Dorsey's at like one? Uh, Jack's at, at maybe two-ish percent, and then the rest of the board combined is probably less than a half a percent. Well, and uh, they say the pump and yeah. dump with Doge as well, and it's like, right, I get the pump part, but we never saw him dump this, the Doge. <laughs> right. And yeah, they say, well, and then they too. add, add uh, SpaceX to it. I'm like, you know that's not publicly traded, Right. Right, yeah, and, and that, uh, that Elon owns more than half the company. So Apparently it's, it's just, it's, a, a, it's about half. It might be a hair under half after a it's recent half, capital right. raise. Okay. But still, it okay. is yeah. a tremendous yeah, amount. Uh, enough to win any vote. Uh, he's going to get some, enough people to vote yeah, with him people. that he can do anything Six he people need to vote with him. <laughs> so, is there yeah. anything I'm missing from the silly uh, Tesla Q FUD math? Oh, sure. Yeah, there's uh, tons and tons of, uh, of Tesla Q notions out there. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I had to make this meme back in 
2019 uh, for the Tesla haters, uh, especially those who are buying Tesla puts, like uh, bankruptcy puts is what you would call them, you know, with a $50 share price on them or something. That's that's delusional, uh, particularly today. The, the Tesla has never financially been stronger than they are today. Over $17 billion worth of cash on the books, uh, an Altman Z score around 20 uh, with other companies, you know, below two, almost all of them, right? Uh, just uh, Tesla has tremendous financial strength and resources available to them and will definitely not go bankrupt. But there are still all these people out there who are betting that it will. So uh, I, I characterize that humorously here as a mental disorder, um, believing uh, themselves to be uh, experts uh, under the grandiose type down here, when the central theme of the delusion is a conviction of having some great but unrecognized skill, talent, insight, or expertise in corporate finance, aerospace engineering, automotive production, renewable energy, neural nets slash autonomous driving software, neuroscience, auto racing, epidemiology, medical device manufacturing, online money transfers slash cryptocurrency development, and or machine brain interfaces despite lack of any actual training, education, or work experience in the specified field. Uh, this is something you'll see on Twitter enough if you uh, dip your toe into the Hashtag Tesla Q. Well, you remember that professional tennis player who, once he went completely bankrupt, put out a series of tweets explaining how I'm still convinced it's going to go to zero and I can't wait to watch you guys ride this pig into the dirt. And it was just like, the thing is, buddy, you made all your money as a professional athlete and you have aged out of that. You're done. And I think what oh, had happened yeah. was he was one of yeah, those guys who that's... made some some small... Uh, options play that worked really well for him and it convinced him that he's more smart than lucky yeah yeah options are very very risky you're not investing when you're playing around with options you are gambling uh, and you've got to get a lot of stuff right for him to pay off big you've got to get the direction and the magnitude and the timing correct <clears throat> and if you miss on any of those three you lose your money and what I always try and tell people is, you may think you're smarter than the, than the traders, the professionals, but you are not faster than the algorithms. No. No, you can't react to the news faster than the algo bots do, for sure. So yeah, it, uh, it pays to be a long-term investor. People who have been invested in Tesla stock for the past five years are up over a thousand percent, even after this bear market drawdown. So that's... Uh, uh, that's what Benjamin Graham would advertise were he still uh, alive. Hey, uh, make, make the, best, uh, the best reasoned investment you can and stick with that. Don't, uh, don't, don't try to get in and out and uh, call tops and bottoms because nobody can call tops and bottoms uh, right all the time. I had a viewer recently press me on both channels asking, demanding, what's the stock price going to do? And I haven't responded yet, but the answer is long term, hopefully improve. Short term, anybody's guess. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and, and the reason for that is that if it were possible to know what the short term stock price movement is going to be, somebody would figure it out and program a trading algo bot to capture that and then it wouldn't be true anymore, <laughs> right? Because the arbitrage would, uh, would net that factor down to zero. It's the same thing as the, uh, the doctor of neuroscience uh, who remarked about the human brain. If it were so simple that we could understand it, we would be so simple that we couldn't. It's the same idea with, with stock prices. You do not know on a daily basis what's going to happen. It is random apart from reaction. So another one I've seen is Tesla is counting FSD revenue when FSD is far from being uh, sufficiently complete to actually count it. Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a popular question. Let's see here if I can find something on deferred revenue uh, for FSD in particular. Uh, 
So yeah, we, we know from a year ago, Zach said that there was about $600 million of FSD deferred revenue sitting on the balance sheet. So what are we talking about here? When you sell someone something that you promise will have a list of features at a future date, the only part of that revenue that you're allowed to claim is the piece that you have earned already. Revenue is declared on your income statement when it is earned. And if there are undelivered features that were advertised as part of a sale, you have to hold that portion of the sale on the balance sheet as deferred revenue liability. So what that's saying is, hey, you've, you've got the car already that you bought with full self-driving as an option on it, and some of the FSD features work already on your car. So for that portion of the amount that you spent on the FSD option, we're going to take that revenue up front because you already have those features. But for the balance of the features that haven't been delivered to your vehicle yet via you know free over-the-air update, we're going to hold that on our balance sheet in the meantime. So that's what the FSD deferred. But how far do they is. have to take? How far do they have to develop it before they can count 100%? Does it have to be door to door, zero intervention guaranteed to claim 100%? Uh, this is a question for Tesla's uh, finance and legal and uh, external auditors to agree upon. So it is whatever that group agrees is what was promised to begin with. Once all of those features that have been promised have been delivered, you're allowed to declare 100% of the revenue. But as progress is being made over time towards 100% feature delivery, you are allowed to declare more of that deferred revenue. So in some future quarters when FSD rolls out wide, expect to see more revenue than you otherwise would have uh, hitting that quarter as more of this deferred revenue balance gets moved off the uh, balance sheet and into the income statements Great. revenue line. Well, I don't want to make this go too long or it becomes a nightmare to edit. I do want to thank you for your time. And All if right. you guys haven't checked out, uh, my recent favorite video is his Q2 uh, earnings estimate. It's a, it's a long one, but it's worth the journey. A lot of the things we talked about today are in there. And he's got uh, on Twitter, of course, the Stevenson uh, indicator. And like my pappy always said, or would have if he hadn't died 40 years before Twitter was invented, if you want your Stevenson indicated, trust James. So <laughs> thank you, everybody, for hanging out. Funny. What did we miss? Yeah. What did we yeah. misunderstand? Leave us all your thoughts, your wisdom, your juicy brilliance in them comments below.